Hey everyone, Thrasher here. In this physics video, we are starting to get into two-dimensional motion. Where we're going with this is something called projectile motion, which is kind of the toughest kinematics. That's, remember, describing the physics of moving objects. It's the toughest scenario we're going to get to. But because it's tough, we want to go over some kind of smaller pieces before we try and tackle those big problems. So even K.5 introducing 2D motion, it's broken up into a couple of videos. All right. So what are some things we need to recognize before we start tackling projectile motion, where we're going in a couple of videos a couple of days. Well, we've learned these two sets of physics equations for constant acceleration. We've learned and we've talked about problems for things moving horizontally and for things moving vertically. We're going to now look at objects moving in both ways. Need an example? Take your pencil, throw it through the air. It moves both left and right or forward and backward and up and down. That's an example of 2D motion. So we've learned these equations, kind of one set for each. We're going to now combine them for the same scenario. All right, that's our plan. That's what we're getting towards. But in order to do this successfully, we need to be aware of several things. First, while we have these two sets of equations, you cannot use them interchangeably. What I mean by that is if I go right back here, here I have velocity in the x direction, the initial horizontal velocity of an object. That is not the same thing as the initial vertical velocity, right? You driving to the right is very different than you driving up into the air, right? That doesn't make sense. You can't mix and match these things. You have to keep them separate. Now, the reasoning why you have to keep them separate, I'm actually going to cover in a different video. I'm not going to prove it here. We'll do that in the next video. But you do. You can't mix and match these things with one exception, this second bullet point right here. There is one thing that is not not so different in the horizontal versus the vertical, and that is time. Remember, time is not a vector. Five minutes of you walking left is still five minutes walking up. The time value isn't any different. Time is a scalar. It does not depend on direction. So these sets of equations, you have time here. It can be used interchangeably. And that usually makes sense because the time something is flying through the air, that's the time it can move up and down. It's the time it can move left and right. So usually time is the key for these math type problems. The time something is maybe moving like this. Here I have this example of this person driving in a car. They're moving to the right and they release a ball. The ball follows this trajectory. The time it takes the ball to fall down is also the time it's moving to the right. So time is actually usually the key. I recommend for the physics problems we're going to encounter, you try and solve for time if it's not given. Or if it's given, just know that's the one thing you can pretty easily plug into each of these equations. Okay. Now, we're going to do an example problem in just a second, but I recommend you still pay attention here because I want to pinpoint something crucial for what we're going to get towards later, projectile motion. Again, I have this same example. I have this person who's just kind of in the passenger seat of a car. They're holding like a tennis ball, and the car is moving to the right. Okay, The car is not stationary. I wish I could animate this, but I can't. <laughs> uh, it's moving to the right, and this person is just going to release Imagine you holding your pencil and you're going to release it, but you're releasing it in a moving car. So the ball is not just going to go straight down if I'm standing over here in like the parking lot. It's going to move a little bit with the car as it's falling. This is in fact a projectile motion kind of problem, but we're just going to strip away to the simplest parts. If you just release it, you're not throwing it forward. You're not throwing it to the right or to the left. It doesn't have any horizontal acceleration. If it's just being released, gravity is accelerating it vertically, downward. But in the left, right, it is not accelerating. Okay? Even if you, say, took a tennis ball and you throw it across your room, the moment it leaves your hand, okay, the moment it's in the air, it's not accelerating left or right. It's accelerating only downward, which means actually these two sets of equations become easier. Because let's see what happens in the horizontal direction when there's no acceleration. This person, they're just releasing the ball. They're not throwing it left or right, so there's no horizontal acceleration. If ax is zero, this whole term disappears. Notice what that means. 
the velocity is staying the same. Jump down and let's look at this equation. Again, if there's no acceleration, the velocity, if you took like the square root of both sides, the velocity is staying the same. And then in fact, if you look at this middle equation, it's a little tougher, I don't wanna spend time like proving it, you could on your own. If this acceleration goes to zero, you're actually left with our original equation for velocity. What equation is that? It's this one right here. If something is not accelerating, obviously we're not gonna worry about these acceleration equations. We can just use our basic equation for velocity. Velocity equals displacement divided by time. Because if it's not accelerating, the velocity is staying the same. So we can almost kind of not use these equations, but just use this much simpler equation. Can I use that for vertical motion? No because it is accelerating down. Remember, gravity's pulling it down. So you would use these equations combined with this equation. Not easy, but easier than also having to use these three things, okay? Now, I'm gonna do an example problem. You could try it on your own, but I actually might recommend you just watch me solve it. So remember, in the horizontal motion, we can just get away with this equation because nothing's accelerating and the time, notice there's time here and there's time in these equations. The time is the same, because again, the time it takes the ball to fall and move vertically is the same time it has to you know, travel a certain distance horizontally. So time is usually used in between. So here is one of the kind of intro problems we're gonna see with this introduction to 2D motion. It's the same scenario. We have this person in a car, they're just gonna release the ball. The car is moving initially at five meters per second. So the car is moving like this with an initial velocity, Vx initial, equal to five. Now you and the ball are moving with the car. So that is also the initial velocity of the ball. You're just releasing it. You're not throwing it forward or backward. So the initial velocity you're moving with the car is five meters per second to the right. Okay. Now again, as it is released, it's going to follow this trajectory from our perspective, like watching in the parking lot. I say in the problem, I'm going to underline it in green. It's released from 1.6. That's how high up the person is from the car. Right here is 1.6, 1.6. Now notice the displacement, it's falling downward. So the displacement, the change in Y, that's going to be negative 1.6. It's falling downward. What is it asking? How far does the ball travel horizontally? How far does it travel horizontally? Now, if you were paying attention, horizontal motion, oh my gosh, that's easy. It just, because it's not accelerating, I don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, all that garbage. It's just this, Vx equals delta x divided by t. So I can find out how far it travels horizontally, delta x, is going to equal Vx times t. So I'm just multiplying both sides by t, and I kind of reverse the order. Sorry, that was a little confusing. All I need is the velocity. Do I know the horizontal velocity? Yeah, it's that 5. It's the speed the car was going at. Multiplied by, uh-oh, the time doesn't give me the time anywhere. I can't solve this equation yet. I'm so close but I can't solve it unless I know the time. So this is another one of those two-step problems. If I can find the time it takes to fall downward, that's the time I would plug in to find out how far it traveled during that motion. So, okay, which equation should I use in the vertical motion to calculate time? Let's see, what else do I know? Do I know the initial velocity of this ball in the vertical direction? Do I know V, Y, not? It's tricky, but I do it zero, because I just released it. Again, not throwing it upwards, not throwing it downwards, just released. When you release something, just for a moment, that initial velocity is zero. I know that the change in Y, the displacement is negative 1.6 meters. Do I know the acceleration? Of course I do. It's falling because of gravity. That's 9.8. These are the three things that I know in the vertical motion. So which equation do you think I could use to calculate the time? It's gonna be this equation. You might not know right away, that's okay, these are tough. But it ends up being this equation. 
because how far does it end up? It ends up falling minus 1.6. Let's say where it starts is at y equals 0. And therefore, y is equal to negative 1.6, right? So let's use this equation. Let me flip over to blue. So y equals y naught plus v naught y t plus 1 half g t squared. Now, v naught y is 0. So this whole term goes away. I have minus 1.6 equals 0. Because let's just say it starts here. It starts at 0. I can choose where I'm starting my measurement. Or just another way, remember, it's falling a delta y of minus 1.6. Okay, So either way you think about it, it's falling minus 1.6. If you started off with 0 and 1.6 here, you'd end up with the same spot. Okay, so 0, because this whole term, this term right here, just disappeared because it has no initial vertical velocity. So then I'm just going to have my plus 1 half. G is minus 9.8 multiplied by T squared. So that's minus 1.6 equals. I'm just going to ignore this now. What's half of negative 9.8? That's negative 4.5 T squared. If I divide both sides by 4.5, negative 4.5, I'll be left with a positive, punch it into your calculator, I'm left with a positive value of 0 0.58. I'm just going to round to a couple spots. Okay. Then I have to take the square root. Oh, excuse me, that is taking the square root. So I already took the square root in my calculator. So you should get an answer, and let me know in the comments, oh, if I made a math mistake. But you should get an answer of t equals 0.58. You should never get a negative time, right? That doesn't make sense. So that's my time. That's what I can plug in right here. So the last little step, then the video's all over. 5 multiplied by, I now have my 0.58, 0 0.58. That gives me an answer of how far does it travel during the time it was falling. It traveled horizontally 5 times 0.58. That gives me about 2.9 meters. So again, let's recap what we did. We can use both horizontal and vertical motion Time often goes in both because the time you're moving horizontally is the time you're moving vertically. And since it's not accelerating horizontally, you can just use this equation. All right, nothing is being accelerated left or right. So you can use our easy equation for horizontal motion. These are tough. All right, that's why we're doing this kind of in steps. If you're a little confused, don't worry. You should be getting practice in class. All right, but thanks for watching this video. I'm signing out. Thanks a lot for watching.